Welcome to Tisky Sour. I should begin by thanking Barnaby Rain and Aaron Bastani for filling my shoes in my week off. And I should also reassure you, while my break may not have left me looking or sounding in any way refreshed, mentally and spiritually, I am very much ready to jump back straight into the news that matters. And I am delighted um, to be joined on my return by Moya Lovian McLean. How are you doing? Well, Michael, I didn't spend the weekend in a field, so I feel very refreshed physically and mentally. You are certainly sounding healthier than me. Um, as for the show, as for the topics we are talking about, we are going to address Britain's hideous deportation policy, the ramifications of Roe versus Wade in the UK, and Keir Starmer pretending he was only a teenager when he ran to be Labour leader. First, though, Scottish independence. Will there be another indie ref next year? Of course, we want to know your comments and questions throughout the show, so do tweet those on the hashtag TiskySour or put them in the comments. Nicola Sturgeon has set a date for the next Scottish independence referendum. If she gets her way, it will be held on the 19th of October 2023. But of course, whether it will take place then is an open question. To hold a legal referendum, which Sturgeon has been clear she's committed to, the Scottish Parliament would need permission from Westminster. That's how it was organised in 2014, through what's called a Section 30 order. Yet Boris Johnson has made it clear he will not be following the path of David Cameron. There will be no consent from London for an indie ref too. But Sturgeon doesn't see that as the end of the story and is taking the case to the Supreme Court. Speaking to Sky News, Sturgeon explained in more detail the logic behind making the request. It wouldn't be necessary, of course, if Boris Johnson and the UK government simply respected democracy and agreed the process to put a referendum beyond legal doubt. But I'm doing the responsible thing. Um, a referendum has to be lawful. I'm not like Boris Johnson, who's, of course, breaching international law with his actions on the Northern Ireland Protocol. I respect the rule of law, uh, which is why we are uh, taking the path that I set out yesterday. That's the responsible thing to do. But I also respect democracy. Uh, Scottish democracy cannot be a a prisoner of Boris Johnson or any UK Prime Minister. Uh, the people of Scotland must have the right to choose. It is then entirely up to the people of Scotland what that choice is. But trying to simply block democracy as uh, unionist politicians are doing simply because they fear the verdict of the Scottish people is not democratic, it's not acceptable and ultimately it is simply not sustainable. So what will the Supreme Court say? Speaking to Radio 4, this was former Supreme Court judge, Lord Sumption. I've got no inside information about this, and it's always dangerous uh, to predict the outcome of a case when you haven't actually heard the arguments on either side. But it's actually a very difficult course that uh, Nicola Sturgeon has charted for herself. Uh, to have a referendum, uh, you need legislation. Uh, she accepts that, and she wants to put a bill through the Scottish Parliament. The problem is uh, that uh, constitutional relationship between England and Scotland uh, is a reserved matter under the Scotland Act, which means that the Scottish Parliament has no power to legislate uh, for anything uh, that affects uh, the constitutional relationship between par the two parts of the United Kingdom. Now, I imagine that the argument will be, well, a referendum doesn't uh, affect the relationship between England and Scotland. Uh, because uh, it's merely advisory, it's essentially uh, a grand assessment of the state of Scottish opinion, which in itself uh, achieves uh, nothing. So there's no reason why we shouldn't do it. The problem about that is going to be a decision which the Supreme Court made in October last year when the Scottish Parliament passed uh, a very elaborate piece of legislation designed to incorporate the, uh, the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child into Scottish law. Um, the Supreme Court held that certain provisions of that Scottish legislation were outside the power uh, of the Scottish Parliament, not because they directly contravened uh, any matter which was reserved to the United Kingdom, but because they put pressure 
on the United Kingdom uh, Parliament and government uh, to do something on a reserved matter, right. which they might not choose to do. And that, was, and that, that is was, going to be a big, a big problem, okay. I would So think. that's a precedent which would be have to be overcome in order to uh, for, for this to, to, to overturn it. I mean, so they would have to distinguish that, yes. So, as Sumption says, the constitutional status of Scotland in relation to Westminster is a reserved power for Westminster. And even if any referendum were just to pressure Westminster as opposed to binding it, recent precedent suggests the Supreme Court will still not allow it to go ahead. So, what happens if the Supreme Court does say no? That's where the next part of Nicola Sturgeon's plan comes in. This was part of her speech to Hollywood yesterday. If it does transpire that there is no lawful way for this parliament to give the people of Scotland the choice of independence in a referendum, and if the UK government continues to deny a Section 30 order, my party will fight the UK general election on this single question. Should Scotland be an independent country? Sturgeon has since clarified that she would consider a general election to have delivered a yes vote only if the SNP win an absolute majority of votes, which is a tall order. In the last general election, the SNP scored 45% of the vote. That's way ahead of any other party, but it is not an absolute majority. And in the most recent elections to Holyrood, they scored 47.7% in the constituency votes. Those are, of course, both commanding results, but they ain't 50%. To get a grasp on Sturgeon's strategy, I spoke earlier to Open Democracy columnist Laurie McFarlane. I started by asking him whether Sturgeon thinks she has a chance of winning at the Supreme Court or whether this is just positioning for the next general election. Well, I think this is partly about recognising that they really do have limited options here. You know, their hands are uh, quite tightly tied in terms of legal options. Um, but I think it's also about political posturing, without a doubt. And I think by proactively taking things to the Supreme Court, sort of escalating it in that way, they've sort of seized the initiative, um, uh, you know, in, in some senses. And so, you know, and if it's rejected, which most people think it will be rejected, that can then be said, look, this is another example of the UK, you know, blocking democracy. But the reality is, of course, that this question would probably end up at the Supreme Court one way or another eventually. Uh, so I think what they've done in some sense is quite clever by, you know, taking it to the Supreme Court on the SNP's terms and sort of seizing the the initiative there, um, because if they're going to take it there at some point, then they might as well sort of do it and, and seize the seize the initiative. Um, but I think overall, you know, I think most legal experts think that it is unlikely that it will uh, that the Supreme Court will say that the Scottish Parliament has uh, you know the right to hold a to, to hold a referendum. There's a little bit of uncertainty. I mean, not everyone thinks it's that clear cut, but it does certainly seem to be that way. And I think it would be surprising uh, if the UK Supreme Court did come out and say actually yes. They can, you know, Scotland can have a referendum without uh, without the UK government sort of giving its blessing. Nicola Sturgeon has said that if they can't have permission for that referendum, she's not going to have sort of an illegal one in the style of, of Catalonia. And so her next step would be to try and win an absolute majority at the next general election. And she's clarified that that would be a majority of votes. Now, to me, that sounds like an incredibly high bar to set yourself, not just to win the most seats, but to win more than 50% of the votes, an absolute majority of the votes. Is there is there any chance of doing that? Or is that a pretty wild gamble that she's taking? I think this is a, a big gamble. I think this is the biggest risk, uh, you know, out, out of all of this for, for a whole range of different reasons. I mean, firstly, I think saying that you're going to fight a general election at some time in the future when we don't know when it's going to be and we don't know what the world's going to look like then, you're going to fight that on a single issue uh, that in and of itself it is a bit of a risk because we don't know what kind of mess you know the country is going to be in then or what's going on, and so there is a risk that there's sort of you know hostage to fortune there. But also, yeah, setting a very high bar. I mean, I mean, fifty percent in a general election. A general election is very different to you know a, a single issue referendum. Um, you know, there are people are voting for lots of different reasons and lots of different things. Um, now, the polls at the moment on independence do suggest that the country is kind of split you know, 50-50, give or take, depending on which, which poll that you look at. Um, so, the, the, you know, it's, it's, it's not as if they're looking at a clear majority at the moment. And then if that if that translates into a general election, you know, it's a big risk and, it, and it's a big gamble. And so I, I do think this is really where Nicholas Surgeon has sort of taken a big risk and, and really sort of put her cards on the table. 
Presuming the Supreme Court do reject this request from Nicola Sturgeon, and we're talking now about the next general election, whenever it is, how do you think this claim or this pledge by Nicola Sturgeon could affect the general election elsewhere? And I'm thinking here about the 2015 general election where the Tories made hay out of this idea that if there was a, a Labour minority government, it would be in hoc to the SNP, you'd have constitutional chaos. I mean, Nicola Sturgeon, in a way, is really setting up the next general election to be a bit like that again. The Tories might be licking their lips. Do you, do you think that's a reasonable fear to have? And do you think Nicola Sturgeon cares if that's to be the case? I don't think I don't think Nicola Sturgeon um, will necessarily will necessarily care. As I say, she will care about the big gamble that she's taken, obviously, in terms of really putting things on the line. I think for me, the really interesting question with regards to, to that side of things is what is Labour's position in all this? Because we know, you know, we know what the Tories are going to say. The question is, well, what is Labour? How is it going to how is it going to respond? Because they will want to avoid, I assume, what happened to Ed Miliband. You know, there was the big pictures of, you know, Alex, um, Alex Salmon with Ed Miliband in his pocket and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, you know, and I think there is an assumption by some that perhaps a Labour government would be a little bit warmer towards the idea of an independence referendum than the Tories. But I'm not sure. I mean, I do think that I'm not sure that's necessarily uh, that clear. I mean, we need to bear in mind as well that Scottish Labour, um, at least, uh, you know, significant parts of Scottish Labour are, you know, more pro-union almost than, you know, Boris Johnson is, if you like. And so I think how Labour decides to go into that election, what its stance is towards Scotland, I think will be key. Um, and I think it's very difficult to say at the moment how that's going to play out. And finally, from everything you've said, I mean, it seems to me like this is a massive gamble taken by Nicola Sturgeon and she's someone who is, you know, in a very strong position. So in some ways, it seems a little bit surprising to me that this is happening. Is the story here potentially that this is about pressure from SNP members and not necessarily Nicola Sturgeon doing exactly what she would have chosen to do if she had a completely free hand? Is, it, is this the pressure of, of the members of the SNP having its effect and Nicola Sturgeon feeling that she has no choice but to make pledges such as, as the ones she has this week? Well, I mean, it's certainly true that among, you know, elements of the, of the base, if you like, the membership, there's been impatience uh, around this and a sense that, you know, Nicola Sturgeon's not, not moving fast enough. But I think the idea, you know, that that Nicola Sturgeon doesn't really want independence or or things like that, you know, she's quite happy. I don't really buy that at all. She's obviously spent her whole career uh, on this. And, you know, she's been around a long, long time. People forget, you know, before she was first minister, she was deputy first minister, has been in power a very, very long time and isn't going to be around forever. Um, and really, I think there is there is this issue, which is that at the moment you have Nicola Sturgeon as leader, which, you know, to be frank, I, I highly doubt we'll see another leader as uh, as sort of capable as her from the SNP for a long time. Uh, and in terms of sort of wider conditions, you know, we're in the we're in the period where Brexit has just happened. There's still a lot of grievance around that in Scotland. You have Boris Johnson as prime minister, who's deeply, deeply, deeply unpopular in Scotland, um, uh, a Tory government, obviously. And so all the conditions there are, are you would think, are sort of somewhat favourable. And so if it's going to happen, you would think that now is is a moment where you know would, would be one of the moments where where it could happen. And I think you know Nicola Sturgeon's probably recognised that. She's recognised that she's not going to be around uh, forever. And there's been speculation about how long she is going to be around, whether she will lead the party into uh, uh, you know into another parliamentary term or not. And so, in some senses, I think this is Nicola Sturgeon sort of yeah p pinning her colours to the mast and saying, look, um, you know we need to do we need to do something on this. And this is sort of my last my last stand. I think so. I'm not terribly surprised. I think clearly elements of it are are pressure from the base, but I do think um, I do think she does, uh, you know, she does definitely want to do this and is conscious about her legacy. I'm sure, like all all senior politicians are. Yet another inhumane deportation flight is set to take off from the UK. Arranged by the Home Office, a charter flight will be taking mothers and grandmothers to Ghana and Nigeria, many of whom have British children or grandchildren. And that's despite the fact that many have been living here for decades. A Guardian report makes for especially grim reading. They say, One 40-year-old mother of three British children has previously been sectioned under the Mental Health Act. She fled Nigeria after being persecuted for being a Christian in a majority Muslim area and travelled to the UK in 2009 on a false passport. She was pregnant at the time, was imprisoned for travelling on the false passport and gave birth while in prison. 
when she became seriously mentally ill, her children were removed. The Home Office then evicted her because her children were no longer living with her. She ended up sleeping on the streets behind a church. So this desperate woman has lost her mental health, her home and her children, but the state thinks she hasn't been treated badly enough. This is someone who, you know, we, we can just deport her to another country. Pretty disgraceful. Speaking to The Guardian from Colnbrook Detention Centre near Heathrow, she says, as the woman and we've been talking about, how can the Home Office separate me from my children? I'm not going to let it happen. If they force me to go, I will die. I will kill myself. I escaped Nigeria to save my life. So, I mean, this is just unbelievably horrific and just... I don't see how anyone can read that or listen to that without thinking this is just an appalling way to treat a human being. There are other horrendous cases. Um, so The Guardian goes on to say that Adani Raji, who is 48, is a gay man facing removal to Nigeria for a second time. He was interviewed by The Guardian in 2017 when he first faced deportation. I'm in the UK because I need protection. If I'm returned to Nigeria, they will kill me, he said. He shared screenshots of death threats he had received from people in Nigeria. One said, quote, So after all that we did to you before, you are still a practicing homosexual. Wait until we see you down here. Wait until we see you down here. That will be the end of you. But it appears that the Home Office is going against its own guidelines. More from The Guardian here. Government guidance published in February 2022 states that LGBTI people are persecuted in Nigeria, that gay men found to be involved in same-sex acts are liable to be jailed for 14 years, while in the northern states where Sharia law prevails, the punishment is death. Campaigners are especially concerned that officials have not properly explored a range of important safeguarding issues concerning the people on the flight. Emma Ginn of Charity Medical Justice said... We fear that our clients with severe mental health issues will be removed without having had a Rule 35 report exploring any history of torture, trafficking, suicide risk and mental conditions. They are in a long queue to get an appointment from one of these reports from the healthcare unit. There continue to be serious defects in the detention safeguarding systems. Moya, I mean, it's difficult to know what to say about this. I mean, I, I think this Guardian story was very effective in sort of bringing out the personal stories of the people who were due to be on this charter flight. And I mean, it's it's just obviously so appalling that this is you know this this added injury is being forced on these people. Yes, I mean, there's there's several elements to this, and one of the most glaring aspects is that the Home Office are getting increasingly cruel, even by their own standards. So we've already established that you know Britain has a really hostile environment to migrants and asylum seekers, but what we're seeing now is a real step up in the sort of attacks on their essential and inalienable rights. So, for example, a lot of the women who are going to be on this flight in particular are being housed at a detention centre called Derwent Side, which is in County Durham. Um, And this detention centre does not have in-house, face-to-face legal um, support, which all the detention centres, such as, um, you know, Colnbrook, Brook House, the ones where men are housed particularly, have that in-person legal support. It is a provision that you have to provide within these detention centres. And Derwent Side is currently being taken to court by an, an anonymous um, refugee and Women for Refugee Women, which is an organisation supporting refugee women. And this legal challenge, very timely and relevant, happened just yesterday. They started hearing the case, which was based upon the fact that Derwent Side is not providing that in-person support. And today we are seeing at least 10 people um, who are primed to be taken from Derwent Side without potentially having access to correct legal support and being put on that flight to Nigeria and Ghana. Um, and a lot of these women have, a, you know, they've come from places with where they've experienced highly, highly traumatic gendered violence, sex and sexual violence, um, and now facing being returned there. Um, So what we've also seen at this point is, again, protesters have gathered outside Derwent side and are currently blocking the vans. And we're getting to a real sort of pattern here where the legal, the attempts to override legal rights and legal challenges and rush past so that people are deported before their you know, legal challenges could be heard um, are being stopped at the very last minute by protests who are physically putting their bodies in front of vans to prevent 
people being taken to the airport, in this case, Birmingham. Um, and every time this happens, such as with the Rwanda flight and stop deportations, and before that, you know, in 2017, we saw um, the Stansted 15. Before these, th- every time these things happen, you see, and then a stepping up and a retaliation of the Home Office. I firmly believe that this flight, which is an orthodox, people say to see, you know, mothers and grandmothers to be shipped away, um, because there's a really gendered aspect to um, asylum seeking. Pr- Pretty Patel in the past has focused on young men as sort of the real boogeyman of asylum seeking. She's trying to, she's saying, we're going to send single men back to Rwanda. But now they've scheduled a flight, which is full of people who often garner more sympathy in the mainstream public sphere, aka women, and is saying, well, doesn't matter. We're sending, we're sending you to this place too. Um, and it really does show a sort of mask off Every time that we are thwarted, we're going to step this up until you are too tired to, first of all, challenge this in the courts, or you don't have the recourse to challenge this in the courts via things like the Bill of Rights, which will remove the provisions protecting asylum seekers in the way that they have now, or you are too tired to challenge this physically via protesting. We're going to wear you out, essentially, as the government policy. Reading the article, I, I have to admit, like, I was... And I mean, I, I should know the law better than I do, but I was kind of surprised that you can be deported if you have children in Britain who are British citizens, because I thought there was a right to family life. I thought that was sort of one of the arguments that's often put forward by lawyers, which is quite effective at stopping things such as deportations. People have, I think it's in the, in the UN Charter of Human Rights, they have a right to family life to, to stay and, and be with their family. Now, if you're deporting someone who has British children or British grandchildren from Britain, I can't possibly see how any judge could say that that doesn't contravene that right. And so I, I see what you're saying. Terms, you know, this, this seems almost provocative from the Home Office. They are basically saying, we can do anything. And there are also echoes of the Windrush scandal here. Like, I mean, this, this isn't the same situation. These aren't people who came over from former colonies while um, people in, in the former British Empire had a legal right to come to the UK. But these are mothers and, and grandmothers, people who have lived here for decades, people who, you know, your common man and woman in the street would probably say, this is someone who should be allowed to stay in the UK. And yet we've got this high profile charter fright kicking them out. Now, do you not think Priti Patel sees any risk here? Is, is, is she just sort of basking in the controversy here. She, she wants to put her cruelty on show. Well, like I said, I don't think it's about whether Patricia Patel is assessing risk because I think all her decisions have shown she is not someone who assesses the risk. She is, to put it plainly, an extremely arrogant politician. She wants to cut through any sort of thing that she sees as red tape and she wants to go ahead and she's been thwarted several times. And that... I, without doing too much COD psychology, but I think that antagonizes her. And she really wants to make her mark. All her like flagship deportation policies have thus far been stopped at the last minute. And these are also supported, may we remind ourselves, by everyone who's in the top tier of government, you know, Boris Johnson, Dominic Raab, this, they all wholly back these policies. Priti Patel is sort of, you know, the architect in the face, but behind her, she has the backing of the PM and um, the deputy PM. Um, So I think it really is a case of the government desperately trying to sort of put their foot down, show their their strength. Um, And as of yet, they haven't been able to, but as we've talked about in previous discussions when it comes to sort of immigration law or human rights, then as soon as the Bill of Rights passes, if it does pass, then we will see a lot less ability to sort of recourse to these the, the provisions that are there and things like a right to family life that you talked about yes people have a right to family life but only if they can get the legal support in time to lodge the appeal and the hearing and the home office right now are just trying to rush past that so they can't because it's much much harder to sort of bring someone back when they've been illegally deported from the country than it is to illegally deport them in the first place once they're gone then they're like well it's fine they're gone anyway um so they're, they're, they're doing that in the interim until they have the sort of legal backing where they don't have to, you know, say, well, we've illegally deported someone who's sorry about that. And they just be like, well, you know, they don't have a right to family life anymore because of X, Y and Z. Um, so it's it's really serious. And I, I really want to shout out the protesters who are putting their physical forms on the line, putting their bodies there. There have been at least five arrests outside Derwent side today. It's pouring with rain, and yet they're still there blocking these vans. And that really does buy time. If you talk to lawyers who work on these cases, then those extra precious hours, minutes, they are vital for getting those last minute appeals over the line and getting people taken off the flight. I think that's a really important point there. I was I was listening to LBC the other day. It's Tom Swarbrick, and he was sort of talking about um, these these protests 
um, outside detention centers. And his point was basically, you know, he was taking this middle ground position. He, he used to work for Theresa May, I think. He was saying he thinks the deportations to Rwanda are terrible because people's claims haven't been assessed. But all other deportations, if their claims have been assessed, they're legitimate and therefore um, we shouldn't have people blocking these flights. And, you know, he was having a debate with, with one of these activists and sort of trying to have this quite abstract argument about whether it should be no borders or whether deportations are ever legitimate. And I think actually the argument is much more simple, which is if you look at the cases, which, you know, as we've laid out, as, as was laid out quite well in that Guardian article, there is no way in hell that the current way that the Home Office works is making these decisions in a, you know, humanitarian um, sympathetic way which has any respect for human rights. So I, I don't think your sort of abstract position on borders matters that much. I think it's, it's pretty plain for any right-thinking person to see that we cannot trust the Home Office to judge who is and who isn't at risk if they get deported from, from Britain because so many people are facing deportation who clearly are at risk and who clearly, you know, the mere fact of them being forced to leave a country where they have everything, you know, where their family are, where their lives are, that is a clear breach of human rights. So, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm totally with you on that, Moya. You know, solidarity to the people who are putting their bodies on the line to stop um, what is clearly a travesty. Keir Starmer has announced that the Labour Party has officially ditched the 2019 manifesto and is starting a new one from scratch. The revelation came in an interview he gave to the New Statesman, an interview sponsored by arms dealer BAE Systems, <laughs> something we would never do because we're supported by you. Um, Starmer was asked how his political views have changed over time, and this is the answer he gave. If you don't change your views as you experience life, then you're probably not going to get very far. And, and I've, I've always been amused by this. Um, people sort of drag out something that you said you know, 40 years ago and say, well, uh, you changed your mind on that. Of course I have. I've changed my mind on loads of things. That's because I've done loads of things. I have um, represented people in court. I've had to sit in a cell with someone who's been condemned to death, knowing that if the decision we make about his case isn't the right decision, we don't win it, that person's going to die. I've run a public service um, and therefore, you know, with 5,000 staff and I've worked in Northern Ireland on some of the proposals under the Good Friday Agreement. That has changed me as I've grown up and a good thing too. If I had not, the idea that as a teenager I had perfectly formed views on everything under the sun, and I never needed to think about them again, would fill me with complete and utter horror. So <laughs> it really would. I mean, who else, hands up anyone in the room who hasn't said something when they were 14, 15, 16, 17 and, and, and never changed their mind on it. I mean, it's, yeah. you know, this whole sort of line of, you know, when you're at school, on the school bus, you once said something, you know, why have you changed your mind? Because I've grown up. It was a characteristically dull performance, but it was also an unbelievably disingenuous one. Diane Abbott made the problem very clear. She tweeted this, Nobody is complaining, as Starmer implies, that he has changed his mind since he was a teenager. The issue is that he has dropped every single one of the 10 pledges he made in 2020 to get elected leader. Diane Abbott is obviously right here. The issue people have with Keir Starmer is not what he said when he was 14, 15, 16, 17. It's what he said when he was 57. Two years ago. And it's not just limited to Starmer's dishonest 10 pledges. Perhaps you remember these inspiring words from both before and after Starmer's leadership bid. I'm Keir Starmer and I'm a proud trade unionist. I've been working with trade unions all my life, starting with legal observing on the whopping picket line, acting for the National Union of Mine Workers, trying to stop the pits being closed, and even a team of us going down in cars to Dover during the P&O dispute to help families who needed some advice on the benefits that they could get. We know, in our hearts, things are gonna have to change. We can see so clearly now who the key workers really are. When we get through this, it'll be because of our NHS staff, our care workers, our ambulance drivers, our emergency services, our cleaners, our porters. It will be because of the hard work and bravery of every key worker as they took on this virus and kept our country going. For too long, they've been taken for granted and poorly paid. They were last. 
and now they should be first. Now, maybe I'm mistaken, but Starmer didn't look like a teenager in that video. He didn't look 14, 15, 16, 17. And he also wasn't a teenager when he made this one of his 10 pledges. So this was number seven, to strengthen workers' rights and trade unions. And he says, or he will, work shoulder to shoulder with trade unions to stand up for working people, tackle insecure work and low pay, repeal the Trade Union Act, oppose Tory attacks on the right to take industrial action and the weakening of workplace rights. So that was Keir Starmer just two years ago. Not a teenager, but aged 57. Yet this was Starmer as leader, just two years later, when rail workers were striking to protect their pay. I am against the strikes. I do not want the strikes to happen. I want the parties to get round the negotiating table and to resolve them. Now, that to me doesn't sound like someone maturing out of the dreamy ideas they had in their youth. It's a fully grown adult saying whatever he thinks will please one group of people. So in the first videos you saw there, they were addressed to Labour members, then saying whatever he thinks will please the right wing press. This is not being open minded and changing one's mind when the facts change. This is being a snake. And as you'll know, this isn't the only example of Starmer's dishonesty. Here's more of Starmer during the 2020 leadership election. Well, look, the attacks on Jeremy Corbyn in that election we've just had were terrible. And they came back at us on the door. They vilified him and they knew what they were doing and they knew why they were doing it. I want to pay tribute to Jeremy Corbyn, who led our party through some really difficult times, who energised our movement and who's a friend as well as a colleague. That didn't look like a teenager making those claims about how the press attacked his colleagues. They were the words of a then 57-year-old man. Yet only two years later, he was saying things like this. Mr. Speaker, my, my personal favourite, my personal favourite is this. This is a document, cir document circulated by his backbench in which they call him the Conservative Corbyn. Prime Minister, I don't think that was intended as a compliment. <laughs> and we've got just one more for you. Um, not because there's any shortage of these kinds of U-turns, but because we don't have all night. This was the fully grown Starmer stating his position on nationalisations during the leadership campaign. I'm asking you to raise your hands. When you go into the next election, would you have any of these in your manifesto, potentially? First of all, raise your hands if you're into scrapping tuition fees. That's everyone. Renationalising water and electricity. Yeah. And here's the leadership pledge. Uh, this is pledge five, common ownership. Public services should be in public hands, not making profits for shareholders. Support common ownership of rail, mail, energy and water and outsourcing in our NHS, local government and justice system. Now, fast forward to 18 months later. This is what a matured Starmer had to say. Will you nationalise the big six energy companies? Well, the immediate problem with the energy companies is how we ensure the supply of energy I'm through the winter um, and into next year. And to do right. that without raising the prices for working people. So that's because an, that, that is an the immediate price. issue. That but, is the immediate problem. But I'm asking you a big principled question. Will you nationalise the big six energy companies? Yes or no? No. No, you will not. This is what you said as part of your 10 pledges. Public services should be in public hands, not making profits for shareholders. Support common ownership of rail, mail, energy and winter. You, you promised that 18 months ago and now you're saying no. Why? That, I don't see nationalisation there. There is well, what, a huge, what, what, what else does, what else does public hands mean? There's a world... Of, well, well, public services should be in public hands. But when it comes to something like energy, we've got an immediate problem in the next few months that we've got to solve. And then when it comes to yeah. common ownership, I'm pragmatic about this. I do not agree with the argument that says um, we must be ideological. Look what so, happens. So what does common ownership mean if it doesn't mean nationalisation? Look what happens when we're ideological about this. Track and trace put into private yeah. sector, £37 billion, pounds, when we were arguing it'd be better in the public sector with local authorities. So I'd be pragmatic about it. And where common ownership is value for money for the taxpayer, 
and delivers better services, see, then there should be common ownership. Poor, poor Ed Miliband believed you when you said that. And he was asked on Newsnight just the other day about this exactly. And he said, we're in favour of common ownership. Absolutely. Wait for the conference. But Keir Starmer said in his leadership campaign he was in favour of public ownership. We haven't changed that commitment. Moya, I want your take on this. Who does Starmer think he's kidding when he thinks the questions about his integrity refer to what he believed as a teenager, not what he pledged just two years ago? He's kidding himself. That's the person Keir Starmer's had to kid throughout his leadership tenure because he's U-turned on so many things and he's abandoned the sort of principles he um, said he'd held dear for the entirety of of his sort of like political life and consciousness. Um, and I think it's quite clear that to do that, he's had to kid himself. He's had to lie to himself about what he really believed. And whether, I don't even know if he's done it in a really active sort of uh, Machiavellian sense, because I don't think he's that adept at politics to do it in that way. You take someone like Boris Johnson, who is an absolute, you know, failed upwards, but has a real like deep down political cunning and he knows how to deliver his lies and sell his lies and act in a way where the public just accept that he is a liar and are like, oh, that's just Boris. Boris is a liar. Keir Starmer can't do that. He doesn't know how to maneuver. And I think something that people need to understand about him is he's extremely thin skinned at the same time we're having a huge ego, um, which leads to a really terrible sort of combination of traits as a political leader. And he's, he's made all these U-turns because he's also desperate to get sort of favorable press and be liked. But at the end of the day, he doesn't really know how to appeal to the general public because he's so desperately, you know, craving their approval, they can smell it on him. And therefore, they won't get it. It's like an animal, you know, they can smell fear on you. Um, and Starmer, Starmer really fails um, in any sort of like charisma, you know, ratings. No one can remember him. There was the recent by-election um, up, up in the north and where they, they, they were like polling people about Keir Starmer and it was just dreadful. The results were absolutely dreadful. Uh, nobody, nobody had really any strong feelings about him. He is a charisma vacuum. And so the person he is kidding ultimately always has to be Keir Starmer because he's the only one who still cares about Keir Starmer. It's interesting when you see a Dan Hodges take you agree with. Um, and there was actually quite a good one after um, Keir Starmer made that comment because he was saying, you know, he recognised that the issue was not that I mean, I mean, also, no one talks about what Keir Starmer thought as a teenager. He's, he's making a complete, you know, this is a complete non sequitur. Like, no one cares, right? The only thing people are criticizing him is for changing his mind over the last two years. And what Dan Hodges was saying is, look, it's obvious what's happened. It's not Keir Starmer has responded to facts changing. If anything, you know, strikes are way more justified now than they were two years ago because inflation is at 10%. So workers are facing pay cuts. So it'd be pretty bizarre to say you're in favor of, of strikes when inflation was 2% and wages were, you know, for a rare period kind of catching up and say, oh, you're suddenly against them when wages in real terms are massively declining. The, the facts have not changed. If anything, they've made strike action ever more justified. So what Dan Hodges was saying is that what's clearly happened here is that Keir Starmer was willing to say anything to get elected to the Labour membership. And the problem for him now is that when he makes whatever commitment he makes going into a general election, why should anyone believe that he is saying anything for any other reason than that he wants to please the electorate. He wants to please the people who will get him elected. And we know that he doesn't have any shame about breaking his promises. So why should you believe this guy, right? Boris Johnson, we talk a lot about how he's sort of a shameless liar. Keir Starmer is also, I mean, quite frankly, a shameless liar. Right? He may not be as vicious and vindictive as Boris Johnson, but he, he is as dishonest, right? It's, it's pretty hard to avoid that fact. And these kind of excuses, oh, it's a, it's a demonstration of maturity that I've changed my mind. It doesn't wash. It doesn't wash with anyone. The US Supreme Court decision to overturn Roe versus Wade has reverberated around the world. This is a rich, modern, developed country which has taken a massive step back on what most of us see as a fundamental right. How could that happen? Yet while that might be the common response here in the UK, not everyone agrees. This was Tory MP Danny Kruger speaking in a debate on the decision. Mr Speaker, I recognise uh, the degree of distress and concern felt by many members in the House uh, on the Supreme Court's decision. Uh, and the fact is I probably disagree with most members who've spoken so far about this question. They think that 
uh, that women have an absolute right of bodily autonomy in this matter. Whereas I think in the, yes. case, in the case of abortion, that right is qualified by the fact that another body is involved. But we can disagree on that question. That's the, pur that the purpose. We disagree on that question. And I offer to members who are trying to talk me down that this is a proper topic for political debate. And my point to the front bench is, I don't understand why we are lecturing the United States on a, on a judgment to return the power of decision over this political question to the states, to, for, to democratic decision makers, rather than leaving it in the hands of the courts. That was Tory MP Danny Kruger saying that women don't have an absolute right to bodily autonomy. It's caused a lot of outrage, which is entirely justified. Kruger fundamentally misconstrues what has happened in the United States. The Supreme Court decision to overturn Roe v. Wade wasn't the result of a good faith debate about whether abortion should be left to elected politicians or to judges. It was the climax of a decades-long campaign by Christian fundamentalists to fundamentally limit the rights of women. And of course, contrary to what Kruger suggested, the court's decision has definitively not provoked a sensitive debate about the respective rights of women and unborn fetuses. Rather, it's led to a wave of automatic state bans on abortion in any and every circumstance. This map shows just how widespread the effects of the decision will be, with abortions either banned or likely to be banned in around half the states of the US. Moya, that comment has caused a lot of outrage. I think it's been viewed more than three million times on, on Twitter. Um, what did you make of it? Is the outrage justified? Oh, I mean, of course the outrage is justified. I think that any um, elected representative who wants to undermine the right that women have to bodily autonomy, especially via abortion, um, there should obviously be outrage. We should be scared about that. Um, it was interesting that you said that Kruger had misconstrued what happened in the US because I don't know if he has. I think that he, obviously what he's trying to present it as is like this good natured debate, as you said. But that is what... Um, you know, abortion, anti-abortion activists do see this as they see this as something that should, you know, that they think ab abortion shouldn't exist. They think that fetal rights should be prevail over, in most cases, the rights of the person carrying the fetus. They think that abortion is murder and they might want to present it in sort of like, oh, we should have this debate. They should have this debate. We should do this. We should do that. But underneath it all, they want abortion outlawed. What's really interesting is when you look at the US and as you referenced, it was a really sort of like lot the campaign to unpick abortion rights has been going on since abortion rights were um passed as federal law. So since the 1970s, there has been a concerted and organized effort to unpick these rights, and they used an incremental approach. And it's really demoralizing, obviously, to see the fruits of this, but it's also a complete roadmap for organizing. And several anti-abortion campaigners, some of the most dogged ones, there's some interesting interviews with them on um, podcasts like Vox Explained, um, talked about how the roadmaps they used were things like the NACCP and Plessy versus Ferguson. So massive civil rights pr progress. Um, they used the same sort of organizing and coalition and strategy, incremental strategy, in order to slowly sort of put these cases forward to the Supreme Court, to test the Supreme Court, how far they go, how, how willing they were to sort of rehear the case for rolling back federal abortion rights and this constitutional right to, an to get an abortion and that's, that is protected under what they call an enumerated right, which means it's not actually expressly um, articulated in the constitution as a right in itself, but comes under, say, the right to privacy and other things that aren't expressly um, you know, protected in the constitution are things like the right to vote. Uh, so, you know, we talk about Kruger being like, oh, you know, he wants this debate. He doesn't want a debate. He clearly is not in favour of abortion. And what we're also seeing that we should be really wary of in the UK is the sort of like the evangelical American Christian right, as you talked about. They are they are linking up internationally with people over here, particularly within the transphobic movement. So a lot of sort of legal cases and legal challenges are following the same pattern that unpicked Roe versus Wade in the UK. They're making these concerted legal challenges in order to unpick the rights that already exist for trans people. And they use, they're also at the same time attacking the things that protect 
stuff like access to contraception, contraception for everyone. And they want to attack things like anti-abortion. If you look at a lot of the funding that's going behind these legal challenges and the alliances that high profile anti-trans, you know, figures and activists have in the UK, they are often with people from the Christian evangelical right in the US who come with a lot of money, a lot of experience and a lot of know-how of this incremental strategy. And we need to be aware of that because an attack on bodily autonomy across women, cis or trans, is, you know, it's an attack on any sort of rights that protect those rights to choose, that right to contraception, that right to simply exist in your body and have a say over it. I suppose to defend um, my, my statement that what he said misconstrues what's going on in the United States is it's kind of a response to a number of people who I've, I've seen on Twitter who have said this is basically faux outrage because what he said isn't actually an extreme position because he said women don't have an absolute right to bodily autonomy. And we're going to talk about sort of UK law in, in specifically in a moment and sort of its limitations. But it is the case that I don't think in any country in the world, um, you know, abortion at any term at any phase of sort of the fetal development is 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 legal and fine without there being you know any sort of exceptional circumstances so people have said why are people getting outraged what he said is actually most people's position that women don't have absolute right to bodily autonomy because at a certain point the unborn baby begins to have some rights so they've said well why are people getting so outraged at this he hasn't said anything extreme and i think you know, I, I, there's something to that. I don't think that's an unreasonable point, but I think what they miss is that he is misconstruing the debate in the United States because this isn't about the Supreme Court saying, oh no, there isn't just an absolute right to bodily autonomy for women because you know there wasn't any way, right? There already were things like term limits in the United States. This is a Supreme Court making a decision which they know um, and you know they seem to be making this for political reasons. They know will lead to the instant sort of outlawing of abortion in all circumstances in a number of states. So while he's saying, you know, these rights aren't absolute, there's a genuine debate to be had here, that's not what this is about in the United States. This is about banning abortion in all circumstances and not just saying the right to bodily autonomy of a pregnant person is limited, but to say they have none whatsoever in no circumstance whatsoever. So that, I suppose that's where I was um, um, coming from with that point. Um, I do want to talk a bit about UK law, um, because sometimes the way we talk about abortion in this country can seem a little complacent if we think everything is, is fine and dandy here. Great Britain, the United Kingdom, is far from a country where women are entitled to a large degree of bodily autonomy compared to other countries in the world. Women here are not entitled to on-demand abortions. Rather, they can get an abortion in the first 24 weeks of pregnancy only if they have the consent of two doctors who must declare the risk of pregnancy to the person's mental or physical health is greater than the risk posed by an abortion. An abortion, sorry. An abortion can be carried out later than 24 weeks only in extreme circumstances, such as when there is a risk to the pregnant person's life or when the fetus has a severe disability. In all other cases, abortion is illegal. So a woman's right to bodily autonomy in the UK is, is very much not absolute and indeed very far from it. Particularly that need to get sign off from two doctors is pretty out of step with most of the developed world. Of course, um, more extreme than that, an issue often overlooked in discussions in Britain is the status of, of abortions in Northern Ireland. Right up until 2019, women in Northern Ireland had no right to an abortion unless their life was at risk. That was changed when an amendment put forward by Stella Creasy was passed in the UK Parliament. But even now, abortions are only legal up to 12 weeks and combined with a lack of provision, it has the consequence that 161 women from Northern Ireland travel to Great Britain to access abortions in 2021 alone. So that is not a situation that Britain should be proud of. Finally, when it comes to opposition to abortion rights on the Tory benches, Danny Kruger is far from alone. In 2011, current Secretary of State for Culture, Media and Sport, Nadine Dorries, tried to pass an amendment which would have reduced the time limit on abortion from 24 to 20 weeks. It was defeated, thankfully. And in a 2017 Good Morning Britain interview, current Minister for Brexit Opportunities, Jacob Rees-Mogg, said this. I'm completely opposed to abortion. Life begins at the point of So why are, you on a, why are you prepared to say you're opposed to abortion, but, not opposed to because the, the same-sex marriage? Then? But because it's a completely different um, kettle of fish. That with, it's a Catholic teaching. No, 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 hold on. It's a different kettle of fish that with um, same-sex marriage, mm -hmm. that is something that people are doing for themselves. 
with abortion. It is something that is done to the unborn child. Are you completely opposed different. to abortion in all circumstances? Um, yes, I am. Rape and incest? Sexual violence? I'm afraid so. Really? Life, life is sacrosanct and begins at the point of conception. And I think it is so wrong. So if a woman is raped, and say you were prime minister, and a woman is raped by a family member, the, right? You would say she had absolutely no right to no, I, have that baby aborted. No, she would have a right under UK law. Yeah, but would, you wouldn't agree with that, right? But that law is not going to change. No, but what's your personal opinion? My personal opinion is that life begins at the point of conception and abortion is morally indefensible. You would then in 2019, when Parliament voted to decriminalise some abortions in Northern Ireland, 99 mostly Tory MPs voted against the change. These included current ministers Dominic Raab, Therese Coffey, Suella Braverman, Simon Clark, Michelle Donnellan, George Eustace and, of course, Jacob Rees-Mogg. So to be clear, for them, it was a matter of conscience not to extend to Northern Irish women the rights of their British counterparts. More recently, other Tories have been less shy about stating their more extreme views. Peter Bone voted in favour of Dorries' 2011 amendment. Here he is speaking on LBC. Pro-choice is a woman has a right to decide. Pro-life, people who support that, you and I tend to be in that category, think that the baby at conception is, is a human being and has a right to life. And therefore, I'm very surprised that the BBC is changing that because everyone talks about pro-life and pro-choice, don't they? Are you surprised? Not sure I am. Well, I... I, I <laughs> Okay. Disappointed. Okay. I mean, in this country, we've always debated this uh, and we've always had a free vote on it. And I think that's the right way. I think, was it Lord Steele that brought in the... Had, has, has regretted what has happened over the years and the number of abortions. So there are arguments to be had. And, and I, I do say that, that there is a point where there is a baby. And I don't think you there is the argument that baby has a right to life. And... That argument, you may say it's Christian, but it's, I think it's, it's a Christian. I think that's a perfectly fair thing. But in this country, we've, as you rightly say, in, we've sort of, I won't say compromise, but we've come to agreement, what, when does life well, start? Well, we, and and we, that's, that's... We've that's, been pragmatic, haven't we? Yeah, um, and, and yes, because medical science is better, babies survive at an earlier age, we've moved the weeks. And I think that's, I think most people still okay. support that. I mean, I should be clear. I, I think people should have, any right to have whatever position they want on abortion. I'm actually perfectly fine with, say, Catholic MPs, you know, out of conscience, saying they personally are morally against abortion. That's fine. People are entitled to their beliefs. I think if you vote to limit abortion for other people, that becomes despicable, right? I think it's very, very different to say, my religion says I shouldn't do this and I, you know, I'm against this. I think, you know, potentially abstaining on votes when it comes to abortion, because you can say, look, it's, it's very difficult for me to engage in this because of my religion. I think abstaining could be perfectly legitimate. Voting against other people's rights to have an abortion, I think is, is despicable, whatever your religious background. Um, Moya, I want your comments on this. Sort of how, how worried should we be um, about Tory MPs who are somewhat opposed to abortion? And how big a problem is it that, that Britain's abortion laws are, are really more restrictive than I think some people realise. I think there's one major thing here which impacts sort of abortion access and it's even more pressing than sort of Danny Kruger or Tory MPs who are opposed to abortion at the moment, which is that our healthcare system is in crisis. So the abortion provisions we have are not actually working in the way they should. There was a report that came out last year which looked at sort of backlog with women having to wait up wait after they've been referred to abortion for at least 10 weeks because of these backlogs in this like in um reproductive care. And in places like Scotland and Northern Ireland, there are even more barriers to abortion. There was a recent article by Rachel Connolly talking about the physical and ge like the geographic barriers that face women seeking abortion in Scotland because no health board in Scotland actually provides abortion care up to the legal limit of 24 weeks, which means that since 2019, at least, at least 100, I think, 70 women have had to travel thousands of miles from Scotland down to England in order to access an abortion that they should be able to get in, you know, their local neighbourhood. And with Northern Ireland is a really interesting one and a really worrying thing because Northern Ireland is the only country where technically abortion is fully decriminalised because it was decriminalized in you know in 2019 and that was a huge victory they had to repeal the eight 
but the provisions to provide abortion have not yet been implemented by the Northern Irish administration because the health minister has refused to commission services. So you've got this bizarre setup where technically abortion is fully fully legal in a way that it actually isn't in the UK. And we talked about, you know, it's not fully decriminalised in, in, in um, England and Wales and Scotland under the Abortion Act, but in Northern Ireland it is. And yet women still cannot access, or pregnant people cannot still not access um, the abortion that they need and the care as well. Traveling thousands of miles, it takes, you know, money, it takes, you know, having a passport. People who are, you know, in low income jobs, who have to sort out childcare, who don't have someone to support them, all those things are barriers. One positive thing that did happen at the start of this year was that um, in England and Wales, then um, telemedicine and at, at early at home abortions were made legal, but that's only up to a certain amount of weeks. And there has been a real uptick in you know, this stay-at-home abortion care and the ability of access because of that. But that's something that happened really recently and it's positive. But now with this sort of precedent that we're seeing in places like America, the question is open again. It is never fully settled. What is positive is in some places like Latin America, which have up until recently had some of the most restrictive abortion um, rules like abortion legislation in the world. We're now seeing the fruits of their organizing where you have, you know, countries like I think it is um, Argentina and uh, Colombia, I think, who, yeah, Colombia as well, have made abortion and have taken the steps to make it fully legal and decriminalized it. So abortion access in Latin America is actually opening up as abortion access in the US is shutting down. Let's Wrap it up there before I lose the ability to speak altogether. Thank you so much, Moya, for joining me this evening. Thank you, Michael. It's been a pleasure listening to this sort of like Jack Bauer version of yourself. <laughs> I was trying to, I've been sucking a strepsil um, every time a video clip has come on. Um, thank you all for tuning in. Um, it's great to have you back with us. We'll be back on Friday at 7 p.m. Hopefully, um, I'll sound and look a little bit fresher. You've been watching Tisky Sour on Navarra Media. Good night.